NZXT is announcing three new cases today, and one of them sounds like this. But on the positive side, they don't all sound like that, and they have some pretty good features, like this cable management. So the new cases are the H7, the H7 Flow, and the H7 Elite. We'll be focusing our review on the H7 Flow, the one that should do a bit better for our benchmarking standards, which are largely performance focused. However, we also have some testing for the Elite version of the case, which is the loud one. And the pricing for these is $130 for the H7 Flow, and it is $200 for the H7 Elite. These are meant to replace the H700 series cases from NZXT previously, so let's get started with the review. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Montec Century 850 Gold Power Supply. The Century 850 Watt is an 80 plus gold certified power supply, also available in 550 Watt and 650 Watt capacities at generally competitive prices with the rest of the market. The Century 850 Watt includes a five year warranty, two EPS 12 volt connectors, six PCIe cables, and plenty of peripheral cables making it easy to scale this modular power supply up or down for your build. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this case at $130 for the Flow version, the non-elite, has a lot of competition, and that would include things like the Fantex P400A, the Lanley O11 Dynamic, uh, Corsair's 4000D Airflow, stuff like that. The $200 case, the Elite, is competing with much fiercer competition like the Fractal Torrent and other $200 cases we've reviewed this year. But one of the things, we'll just put this out there right away, uh, is this is the first NZXT product that Patrick and I collectively have been actually impressed with in quite a while. NZXT's had a number of misses and duds over the last couple of years. Um, some of it caught on fire, some of it just wasn't good, uh, less severe, but still not a great outcome. And this one, the H7 Flow at least, we like a lot of things about it. The kale management's good, the build quality overall is pretty pretty sturdy, pretty solid for the materials choices, for the, the way the structure feels, for the panel thickness and quality, and the layout's pretty good as well, which lends itself to good ease of installation features. So it starts us off on a positive note for an NZXT product, which is great, because it's been a little while since we've had something we felt really strongly about in the positive direction from NZXT. Certainly plenty of negative stuff over the last few years to anchor it, and then more recently sort of in the middle. So uh, this is shaping up to be an interesting review. Let's get started with the build notes, look through what made us so interested in it, and then we'll talk about the thermal performance. The NZXT H7 cases all have an intentionally simple look, with a tempered glass panel covering one entire side of the case and zero protruding handles or fasteners to interrupt the planes of the case. If NZXT had a way to make this case hover, the feet would probably be gone as well. Maybe, and this is just an idea, they could use a bunch of NZXT pucks to turn it into a monorail or something. The snaps that hold the panels onto the case are firm enough that screws aren't necessary, which is sort of a demonstration in peak modern IKEA design. Although we do prefer to have at least the option of screwing down panels when glass is involved, if only to make it easier to secure it when moving. Straight from the factory, the snaps were a little too firm, enough that we were worried about bending the panels when prying them off with the shallow handles at the rear of the case. After some use though, this issue went away. We're not focusing on the Elite today, but it does deserve some attention for its lighting. Our opinions on sealed front panels are well known and documented at this point, but the lighting around the edges of the three F140 RGB fans is even and illuminates a smooth gradient around the fan frame and the rain around the fan hub, and it makes the case look almost like a render, and we mean that in a good way. The individual LEDs are still visible within the rain, but NZXT has done a good job to diffuse the light to minimize sharp pinpoints of light. Out of the box, all case fans and lighting in the Elite are handled by a combined controller that takes SATA power and a USB header for software control via CAM. We feel the same way about CAM and NZXT smart devices that we do about sealed front panels, but there's no getting away from bloatware when it comes to RGB, so just sort of a fact of life. A cable management is the highlight of this set of cases. There are two broad plastic cable channels behind the motherboard tray in perfect locations for IO and power supply cables. And a total of 10 Velcro straps are built into the case. The open hooks along the sides of the plastic channels make it easy to cram cables in before tying them down for more permanent retention of those cables. It's effortless overall to get cables running in neat, photogenic lines. Slack cables could present a problem with larger than normal power supplies, but there was enough space between the end of our 16 centimeter power supply and the hard drive cage. And also the hard drive cage can be removed or pushed forward another two and a half centimeters if you need to. 
Even in the H7 Elite, which contains an RGB and fan controller with tons of additional wiring, everything fit into the built-in channels. Although, it doesn't change the fact that you still have to deal with a mess of cables. Cable management is generally something that NZXT has paid attention to at least since the H440, and it gets full marks with the H7. NZXT has impressed us in this department, even if on the airflow side, the Elite is very lacking. The hard drive cage we mentioned is bare metal with room for two three and a half inch drives. There are two two and a half inch SSD mounts behind the motherboard tray and a further two in the accessory kit that can be mounted to the top of the power supply shroud. NZXT has simplified the design of the SSD mounts enough that it's cost effective to just toss in a couple extras and we approve of that. Front I.O. includes two USB type A ports, which is never a given with NZXT. It's rare that you get more than one plus one Type-C port. The Type-A ports are colored purple, typical of NZXT's attention to detail, and in the same vein, the power button contains a tiny metal spring rather than the far more typical molded plastic spring that we see in cases, and it's fastened to the top panel itself to make it easy to line up and reattach the panel without pressing or wedging the button. As with previous cases, there's a single four-pole mic and headphone jack, but there's no longer a splitter included in the accessory kit, so plan accordingly. The case fans included in the flow are two 120mm F120Q F-Series quiet fans, which are three-pin DC controlled. The NZXT logo is stamped into the hub as well, which is a nice touch, similar to what we saw with height in the Y60, but we have a hard time believing that these straight-edged fan blades of the H7 serve much purpose beyond fitting NZXT's sometimes asinine aesthetic. Asinine in the sense here that they really do push for visuals and IKEA-style modernism perhaps more than they should sometimes. We'll check these in the fan tester one day, but for now, the H7 Flow has a fully ventilated front and top panels, so the two stock fans are positioned for conventional front intake and rear exhaust, rather than the H500's unusual negative pressure arrangement that actually, as long as it stayed negative pressure, worked out okay. NTXT has also opted for solid expansion slot covers that fit flush together and seal off the rear of the case, making a negative pressure arrangement less practical. The mesh filters on the front and top panels of the flow are similar to the large, unreinforced filters in the Corsair 5000D airflow and related cases. The advantage of foregoing reinforcement is that there are no plastic bars to get in the way of lighting or air. And then the disadvantage, of course, is that the nylon mesh can be loose and wrinkly. This is more of an issue with the top filter. The front filter is larger, but it's mounted directly against the support with sufficient distance from the fans. While the top filter is flush with the top fan mounts and may sag inwards with top intake configurations and gravity, especially given manufacturing variants. The same top filter is present on all three H7 models, and we strongly suspect NZXT will have some RMAs or replacements over the coming months because of this. The two other filters in the case are a mildly inconvenient rear eject power supply filter and an over-engineered tiny filter under the gap at the bottom of the front panel. This one is necessary in the solid fronted H7 and H7 Elite, but the flow has a mesh front panel, so the small vent is just one more thing to clean. The front of the case contains a simple fan and radiator tray held in with two captive screws, not thumb screws though. And like the bottom filter, this feature is built around the solid front panels of the H7 and H7 Elite, but it works out well for the flow. The H7 cases have no built-in vertical GPU mounting, but NZXT is selling a new add-on kit for $90. It's a three-slot PCIe Gen 4 model, and it drops in as a single unit to replace all of the horizontal slots. Based on past experience and testing, using a vertical kit like this that places the GPU back towards the motherboard should allow for enough clearance to at least match the stock thermal performance. It will depend, however, on how large the GPU is. The closer it is to the glass, especially if it's within one inch of the glass, the more it's going to suffocate. Claimed radiator support is up to 360 millimeters for both the top and the front mount, but there are some caveats. First, CLCs longer than 280 millimeters at the front of the case will only fit tubes up. And second, 360 mil radiators at the top of the case may only fit tubes front, depending, of course, on the radiator and the tanks. Together, these two points mean that it would be difficult to fit two full-length radiators with fans simultaneously with two sets of fittings and tubes competing for space in one corner. And that, of course, includes open loop or closed loop. The spec sheet claims that the H7 supports EATX boards, but this would require removing the cable bar. There are no EATX accommodations like standoffs or cable cutouts 
beyond the fact that larger boards can physically fit within the confines of the case, so don't try it. We did our usual set of thermal tests with the H7 Flow, but we also added a baseline torture test for the Elite. We're not planning to do a full standalone review of the Elite variant, it's pretty similar to this one, but this will at least give us an idea for how its four fans and closed front panel stack up against the Flow's two fans and ventilated panel. You already heard the noise issues earlier. The first test shows only some NZXE cases. Baseline CPU temperature was 48 degrees Celsius above ambient, which dropped down to 45 degrees with the removal of the front panel. A fairly small delta like that is what we want to see in mesh-fronted cases, indicating that the front panel isn't hurting the performance more than necessary. Despite sharing a designation, the original H510 Flow here scored worse with a 52 degree average, the top panel is the main reason for that because it's much less open, and the front panel has a smaller surface area over which air can be taken in. As for the H7 Elite, that one brute forced its way into a 48 degree average, tying it with the flow by using three 1800 RPM, 140 millimeter intake fans, and a 140 mil, 1200 RPM exhaust fan. And that's versus just two fans, both 120, 1200 RPM options in the flow. So for the Elite, it's really not looking efficient, and it is noisy. Outside of NZXT, though, Fractal's Meshify 2 Compact is one of the closest matches in price and purpose. The H7 Flow comes with an error of its 47 degree average in this test. The cheaper but also comparable Corsair 4000D Airflow averaged 50 degrees here, and the P400A remains about $100 to $110 these days and remains a close competitor, within error of the H7 Flow also. Baseline for the GPU torture test was 52 degrees Celsius above ambient, down to 51 degrees with the removal of the front panel. That's not enough of a difference to exit the margin of error, and so they're about the same. GPU thermals are often where cases like the H7 Flow's fan arrangement fall short. Our CPU tower cooler benefits directly from both the rear exhaust and the front intake, but our GPU has to rely mostly on the pressure system, whether positive or negative, that the case builds, and on the intake fan for active airflow. The NZXT cases are all clustered around the same mark here, other than the H510 Elite's impressively bad result. The H7 Flow manages well comparatively, beating the H510 Flow's 54 degree average, and the H7 Elite's four stock fans give it a boost here to a 50 degree average. Comparatively, the Meshify 2 Compact's average was 56 degrees, while the 4000D Airflow tied at 52. That leaves the H7 Flow looking pretty good for a two-fan case. The P400A surpasses the H7 Flow, though, and is often around the same price or cheaper. Blender standalone component thermals are next, reducing the heat load here. This brought the CPU average to 35 degrees Celsius above ambient. That's an impressive result and is better than the 37 degree average for the H510 Flow and the 4000D Airflow, and with an error of the Meshify 2 Compact's 36 degree average. Rendering on the GPU instead brought it to 23 Three degrees above ambient, again beating the H510 flow and surpassing the 4000D airflow's 24 degree average. The gaming stand in test, Firestrike averaged 52 degrees on the GPU, the same as the baseline GPU torture test. The NZXT and Fractal cases we've discussed so far also maintained steady averages, although the Meshfy 2 Compact averaged 57 degrees in this test giving the H7 Flow a larger lead. Our standardized set of fans, two 140mm intakes and one 120mm exhaust, is a straight upgrade from the stock set. The CPU average dropped to 44 degrees, beaten by a few cases with single layer mesh, but technically better than the Meshfy 2 Compact's 47 degree average. The H510 Flow put in a much better performance here than the stock test with a 43 degree average sticking closer to the H7 Flow's performance. The GPU average dropped to 50 degrees over ambient, tying the Meshfy 2 Compact and the 4000D Airflow and handily beating the H510 Flow at 56 degrees. At 100% case fan speed, we measured the H7 Flow's noise level at about 39.5 dBA at 20 inches distance, essentially tied with the Meshfy 2 Compact's 39 dBA. It's not a loud case, which is to be expected with only two run-of-the-mill case fans installed. In contrast, the H7 Elite at full speed makes a noise like fabric being ripped apart, with three extremely fast fans pulling air at an angle through a narrow vent on the front. Have a listen. Again, this isn't a review of the Elite, but it came out with this case, and it's the same body, ultimately. We can't go through the whole review without mentioning that noise, because it's loud, and perhaps more importantly, it's inconsistent, it's extremely annoying, it comes up and down in volume and type of noise, and you need to cut the fan speed to really deal with this. How NZXT shipped this out the door 
sounding like that is beyond us, but the fan speed is somewhat necessary to cope with that front panel. So they were in a hard spot and they chose the wrong answer. The H7 Flow reached our 36 dBA noise threshold with a reduction to 73% case fan speed, bringing the CPU average up to 50 degrees. Noise normalized testing is where cases with larger fans like the Lancold 215 and the Torrent shine, and cases like the H7 Flow or the Meshify 2 Compact at 49 degrees end up in the middle of the chart. In the same test, GPU average climbs to 54 degrees. The Flow then remains in the middle of the stack, while all the other cases shuffle around it. The Meshify 2 Compact averaged 59, while the 4000D Airflow averaged 53. So the Flow's performance isn't exceptional, but it's at least consistently good. So that's the H7. Now, the Elite version just, we really don't think it's worth it. The LEDs are a nice touch. They did a pretty good job overall with the diffusion of the lighting uh, and the LED rings, but the case itself at $200, it's just not as competitive as this is at 130. So don't write off the H7 series wholesale, but probably for the most part, ignore the H7 Elite, especially because that noise problem there's some turbulence there. You, you could bring it down with, uh, and, and turbulent flow can be a good thing, but in this instance, you could bring down some of that wind noise by dropping the fan RPM, but the fan RPM is largely what's getting the H7 to, for the, the Elite that is, to competitive levels with cases that are more airflow focused. So NZXT is kind of, they're trying to reconcile their obsession with glass closed off cases uh, by, shoving it full of fans that are high speed and it's just that you saw you heard the result the good news is NZXT is no longer completely adverse to function focused designs like this one like the H510 flow previously where there was a time at which an NZXT PM told us on a call uh, asked us what we would be interested in seeing we said we'd like to see a mesh fronted case and the answer was we'll never do that so this is one where we think the the things that make this case good or make us like this case. Uh, it's got NZXT's consistent attention to materials and features like kale management. They've done pretty well with kale management in general over the last several years, and that continues here at a higher level than before. However, the important part is NZXT has matched those attention to detail, attention to materials, ease of installation features with thermal performance and functionality, uh, at least with the flow version of the case. So at $130, this is probably the best performer we've seen from NZXT in years. And uh, it's also competitive with Fractal. So Fractal's Meshify 2 series, like the Compact, would be good competitors to this in price and in performance, but NZXT is, is fighting fiercely there. So overall, we're comfortable recommending the H7 Flow at least, and we would also recommend looking at, uh, if you're interested in this case, Corsair's 4000D Airflow, the Fantex P400A, it's a bit older now, and it definitely feels like an older case internally, but it's got competitive performance, and the uh, Fractal Meshify 2 series. Those are the ones to look at competitively if you're also interested in this, but we are good with recommending this one if it's sort of in the class, the price class case you're looking for. Uh, so good showing from NZXT, hopefully they keep it up. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus for bonus videos. We'll see you all next time.